Today, I'm speaking with Rachel Hunt. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad to meet with you. And to give a quick bio here for Rachel, Rachel's from rural Texas. She's married with two adult children, and she has a strong interest in psychology, philosophy, and communication, as well as creative arts and home improvement. She was raised in Christian science, which is a little different. Most of my interviews are for uh, typical Protestant Christianity, but she was raised in Christian science, but drifted off as a teenager. She explored Scientology, the law of attraction, and a variety of Protestant churches before settling comfortably into atheism. She is on the board of directors of Recovering from Religion, and she is the director of the support group program, which hosts over 30 meetings each month. They also have several monthly specialty meetings, including chapters for women, men, LGBTQIA+, and suicide loss survivors. For anyone that doesn't know, RFR's mission is to provide hope, healing, and support to people struggling with issues of doubt or non-belief. They offer peer support, and for those who need professional therapy, they often can help connect clients to the Secular Therapy Project, which is sort of RFR's sibling organization. Uh, Rachel is also a ballroom dance teacher, and she has competed professionally in dance sport ballroom dance competitions. She's also performed, choreographed, and co-directed for various local community theaters. So, wow, you're a lot of creativity there. And she also loves riding motorcycles. So that's a, that's a whole bunch. If you could tell us more about yourself, either dive into what I just shared or something I didn't share, and that we'd love to just get to know people. Well, that was awesome. Unfortunately, something has changed a little bit since you got that bio from me. Um, uh, you said that I was the director of the support group program for Recovering from Religion, and that was true up until about three days ago. And um, I actually passed that position on to a very capable other volunteer, and now I am working with the helpline as the assistant director of the helpline project. So it's still Recovering from Religion. I'm still on the board. I'm still doing lots of things with them, but I no longer have that official position of the support group's director. Also, since you got that bio, the support groups program has grown and we now have over 45 monthly meetings so i'm very proud of that that's awesome that is so cool and a lot of a lot of room for people to uh, get connected and, and by the way we will be diving into rfr a little bit more at the end of the interview so uh if anyone wants to hear more about that we'll be doing that um can you tell us more about as well your hobbies and anything fun or quirky about yourself uh yeah well um I am kind of semi-retired from my ballroom dancing. Um, I still have my studio, but I don't teach a whole lot. Um, I do a lot of people that just kind of want to learn how to dance for their weddings um, and a few people that are serious dancers, which is really fun. Um, recently, my son and I dug a pond in our backyard because my son well. saw a toad. <laughs> my son is a doll. He's 28 and he lives with us for the moment, but he saw a toad on our property and living in rural Texas, um, it's pretty arid. So seeing a toad was very exciting and he decided he needed to dig a hole in our backyard. And since it's all rock, he had to use a pickaxe <laughs> and it was crazy. <laughs> so uh, that's my fun fact for the day. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. My, we, where I live here in Atlanta, we have, it's a lot more um, wet and so forth because of the, just where we live is near a forest. And we get, our, my kids are picking up frogs, like little baby teeny ones all the time. It's, Aww, they love it. They that's love it. so cute. Yeah. I love that. Yep. It's like a little zoo. Well, um, we love if we could to uh, invite people to share their, their background stories. I love how yours is going to be a little bit different, at least at the beginning, because you did not grow up in typical Protestant Christianity, which is kind of my home base, as it were, where I interview most people from. But I just I love also learning how different backgrounds evolved. And like, so if you could take us back, tell us what you were taught by your parents and your church or whatever they would have called it. And we just look forward to, uh, you know, getting to know you and hearing your story. Great. Thanks, Tim. So um, first of all, um, Christian science would be considered under the umbrella of Protestantism. Um, it's still a Protestant form of Christianity, uh, but it's just a little bit more recent, I guess. Um, it's based in the New Thought Movement, actually. Um, Mary Baker Eddy was the founder, and I'm not sure what her previous background was, but it was probably some sort of, you know, Baptist or Methodist or, you know, Calvinist or something like that. Um, I haven't looked into her history too much, but she wrote this book called uh, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And this was part of the New Thought Movement of the um, late 1800s. To early 1900s. Norman Vincent Peale was kind of part of that movement. Um, but uh, she wrote this book and her idea was, you know, like a lot of people, she got inspired and she thought, I understand the Bible. So she wrote this book and uh, the church is founded on readings from the Bible and we use the King James Version and Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. So one thing that's very interesting about Christian science is that rather than having leaders like pastors or preachers, um, or priests or anything like that, 
what they have instead are readers. And the church is set up so that the Mother Church in Boston will create a weekly lesson every week for the entire you know, national or international organization. All of the branches will use this same weekly lesson. And it is um, comprised of uh, passages that have been specifically selected from the two books to complement each other and uh, expound on a particular theme. Um, but the mm-hmm. readers, there's a first reader who reads from the Bible and a second reader who reads from Science and Health. They just present this as written from the mother church. And there's no editorializing. There's no preaching. There's no homily. There's absolutely nothing personal from the readers. They just read the text from the books. Um, Mm, This is is very, yeah, it's different. Um, In a way, it's a lot more egalitarian. Um, You don't have a single like charismatic person, which is so popular today. You just have the text. Um, And so it tends to be a little bit more intellectual religion. It's a, it's a less, um, it's a less charismatic thing. It's it's less emotional. It tended to be more sort of contemplative and and sort of quiet in a way, um, which I enjoyed. And in a way, that sort of set me up for being more skeptical in the future because it wasn't so m- emotionally manipulative that I wasn't able to see the inconsistencies, right? Uh, and this is probably why the religion is in decline, because they're not using those highly emotionally manipulative techniques to keep people in. Can I ask, are there like factions within it at all that say you're misinterpreting this or that? Like where if if it's just a reading mm-hmm. and nobody's saying, here's the reading, but this is how you interpret it. If that's not present, then are people kind of going to their own separate corners and saying, yeah, but I I know I know what this really how to interpret it. And someone else, you know, maybe put it on a blog or a YouTube video. And someone else responds like, no, 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 you're misinterpreting that. Are people, are there factions where they're kind of arguing or are they just like, just, just, it doesn't matter what your interpretation is, just read it and sit down, which is kind of like, reminds me of the Quakers a little bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was growing up, of course, we didn't have YouTube and we didn't have bloggers. And and so um, I wasn't aware of any kind of fact. Um, the Mother Church is in control of everything. They also publish the Christian Science Monitor, which is a very well-respected news organization that only has a very small section about religion. Um, but they had, you know, magazines and so forth. But all of this was controlled very uh, centrally from the Mother Church in Boston. Now, I will tell you a little story about how I discovered that not everyone agrees with the same things. Um, my mother sent me to this lovely summer camp in Missouri called the Cedars, and it was um, it was a Christian science camp. So the camp wasn't a revival camp. It, we were there to ride horses and swim and learn about the forest, things like that. But uh, I remember that when I went the first time, I was very excited to uh, be away at camp and meet other kids and just have a good time over the summer in a place I'd never been before. And I had recently been introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, the board game, which was, you know, just sort of a very um, niche thing in the 80s. And I brought my little board game that I had brought And one of the counselors was scandalized. She was like, you absolutely should not be playing that game. That's that's evil. It has dice in it or whatever. And she she wasn't very clear on exactly why I shouldn't have it. She just was saying, you absolutely should not have brought that. I don't know what's wrong with you. And I remember when I got home, I asked my mom about it. And she goes, well, some people are purists. And I was like, what? What what does that mean? You know, Um, that was one little hint that not everybody agrees with the same thing, you know? Um, it's so weird how growing up, we just accept these things as a matter of truth. Here's another story that kind of illustrates that. Uh, when I was a little bit, I don't know, I actually don't remember if this was before or after the summer camp experience. It might have been before, but I had a friend who lived across the street, a little boy. We were probably 10 or 11. And uh, I remember having a discussion with him about Jesus and God or whatever. And, and he said something, uh, I don't even remember what the disagreement was, but he said something that was different from what I was taught in church, some doctrinal difference. He didn't go to my church. So of course he thought something different. And I remember correcting him. I was like, no, that's not true because, you know, 
A, B, C, whatever they taught me in church is true. Like, you're just wrong. Sorry. And he was like, no, that's not true at all. So we got in this argument and I got really angry with him. I was like, why are you saying the wrong things? What's wrong with you? So again, I went to my mom and I said, mom, he's saying these things that are wrong. It's just so frustrating. And she said, well, not everybody believes what we believe. And I was like, excuse me, what? I, I beg your pardon. I, I really think up to that point, I thought that what we were taught in Sunday school was just as true as what we were taught in regular school. And I had no reason to question or think that there was any difference between those two things. And when she said that not everyone believes what we believe, I suddenly realized that they had been giving me a wrong impression this whole time. They knew that not everybody agreed with what we were taught in church. It was not an, an agreed upon thing that everybody accepted. It was different. It was a there was a qualitative difference between what we're taught in church and what we're taught in school. Now, that was the what I thought at the time, and I still believe that to be true. But of course, there's a very popular movement trying to move what's in church over to school and make everyone believe that, you know, whatever you learn in church is somehow more tr true than what you learn in school. And you know, obviously, I don't agree with that movement, but. That's it's interesting. It it's interesting too how often you see the same group, like not just like we believe this, but that other group over there, they believe something very different. But also we believe something. And then within like a few years, that same group changes it. Mm -hmm. Uh like I, I remember people that talk about the JWs, they talk about, I, I think if I've got the right group, they talk about the 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 new light, where they're like, God has given us new light. And you know, before you couldn't do this, but now you can. God mm -hmm. has given us new light. And I went to Bible college and I went to a couple of Bible colleges, but one of them at the beginning of my time, you could not go to a movie theater or play playing cards. But by the end of my time, those were both completely acceptable. Yeah. Uh, another Bible college I went to much more conservative and, and uh, arguably horrible. Uh, but when, when I first went there, uh, you could not do interracial dating. Mm -hmm. By the time I left or shortly thereafter, you could. And mm -hmm. it was like, Oh, wait a second. Like, which way is this? Like, is interracial dating a problem or not? And I could go into details as to why I think they changed it. But it's just, it's weird how some of the same groups change it. And even like the Catholic church, you look at Vatican II, you're like, that's a lot of change when they made the, you know, the big, uh, I forget when it was, but when Vatican II came out, like all kinds of theology is changing. And like, what is this? You're trying to make Mary the co-salvatrix, the co-savior with Christ? Like, yeah. where is that? But all of a sudden, it's like the, the, the theology as well as the practical application switches. Mm -hmm. And you just think it is. It's like, It raises alarm bells in your head. And it's like, this, this, this doesn't make sense. Why are we so wishy-washy? Yeah, yeah. It's it's strange. On the one hand, as a, a skeptic and someone who's a lifelong learner, I love the idea that people are willing to change their views and to update them based on new information. But at the same time, they keep insisting that it was always that way or that they got this, you know, from divine revelation rather than from actual, you know, science scientific experience or, you know, empirical evidence. And uh, so I, I just wish that they would be willing to just go, no, we just changed our minds because we learned something new that maybe the people who wrote the Bible didn't know. You know, maybe we could look at it that way. That might be a little better. Yeah. And maybe <laughs> since we were dogmatic before and we realized we shouldn't have been, now maybe the, the pile of stuff that's left that we're still dogmatic about, maybe we should be less dogmatic about that too. Yeah. Ever thought about maybe decreasing your confidence level when you found out you were wrong once, maybe? I, I don't know. <laughs> so what happened next in your story? Oh, well, um, you know, mostly for me, Christian science was about just going to church on Sundays because my mother insisted that I go. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I had a few friends there, uh, but we weren't one of those churches that has, you know, youth groups and and all kinds of things that are happening every day. We we had church on Sunday morning and we had, there was a Wednesday night service that I wasn't required to go to because I often had after school activities. Um, but when I got a little bit older and I started doing things on the weekends, I do remember having a conversation with my mom where I would like, you know, to me, church was like whatever you did, you know, when you had to go. Uh, but I would always find, you know, quite often something else to do on Sundays. And she had to tell me, sit me down and say, no, church isn't something that you do when you have nothing better to do. Church is important. And I'm like, OK, mom, but do I have to go this Sunday because I have this other thing, <laughs> you know? Um, and just over time, I think, you know, I, I know that a lot of your uh 
a lot of your interviewees come from backgrounds where they were very heavily involved and they really had bought in to the beliefs of their church and and they tried very hard to have a relationship with God and to do all the things and to be really bought in. I was never like that. I was really just sort of there because my mother wanted me to be. There was a time when I tried hard. Um, I do remember there were these uh, cute little book sets that were like half the size of a normal book. Um, you know, they were like these cute little books. And I saw them at the Christian Science Reading Room and I told my mom, oh, mom, can I have those books? They were they were the Bible and Science and Health set. It was like a little matched set because you're supposed to read your lesson every day. And I said, oh, mom, can I have those cute little books? And she said, well, I will buy them for you, but you have to read your lesson every day. That's what they're for. I was like, oh, okay, mom, I will. And of course I didn't, you know, I loved them. They were so cute and I tried, but it just was boring. So I didn't do it. Um, but I think what I started to say before is that over time, it was pretty easy for me to start noticing inconsistencies or noticing things that didn't quite seem like they matched up with my world experience or with what I was learning in school. And so my commitment to the beliefs of Christian science did fade over time. And then um, I moved out when I was 18 and stopped going to church at that point. And it wasn't until much, much later that I started exploring religion of any kind again. Um, mm. I did want to mention one of the things, sorry, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, when you were in, in the Christian science church, though, I guess maybe this is uh, two questions that were the uh, flip side of, of the one or the other. Was there a message of you're a sinner who needs salvation? And if if not, or if it was very different from what you understand of typical Protestant churches messaging around that, what were some of the like main core preachments that you would have heard? Perfect question. That was just what I was going to talk about. The main core belief of Christian science is that the world is sort of an illusion and that everything is perfect in the mind of God, and that if you can just get your mind aligned with the mind of God, that you will see that the world is perfect and all uh, pain, sin, suffering, disease, illness, injury will all disappear, right? So this is very closely aligned with the New Thought Movement when you talk about Think and Grow Rich or the, sci or, um, the Power of Positive Thinking, this is very similar. And of course, more modern audiences will recognize it as being kind of like the matrix, right? If you can just, you know, see the code, then you'll understand how to manipulate it and things will be different. Um, it's it reminds really me too very... of the name it and claim it theology. Have you heard of that one? I haven't heard that. Just a lot of preachers be like, you know, God wants, God wants you healthy. He wants you happy. He wants you wealthy because the more happy you are, the more healthy you are, the more you're going to be able to do things for the kingdom. So you need to just envision like God wants you wealthy. So just mm -hmm. claim it, like claim it, name it and claim it and God will give it to you. And if you don't, it's your fault for lack of faith. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that is very much in line with all of the other kind of power of positive thinking type things for sure. Um, and that is definitely very similar to what Christian science teaches, but they don't teach it in a, you're a terrible person if you can't do this kind of way. I think that they're a lot more gracious in terms of the fact that this is not necessarily easy and people spend lifetimes trying to learn how to do it. Um, and obviously that makes it a little bit easier to explain away anytime it doesn't work. Um, the main focus is really about healing and in the Wednesday night services, they encourage people to stand up and give testimony about how they were healed by their faith. Um, and this is normally something like, oh, you know, I fell and I thought I was really hurt, but then I prayed and then I got up and I was fine. Or, uh, you know, I... I can't even think of anything else. I remember for me personally, there were several times when I had a headache and I would pray and then the headache would go away. And so I, I felt like that was proof that it worked, um, at least on a small level. I do remember having a conversation with a friend years later where I, he was a, a very new age kind of, um, you know, heal your vibrational energy kind of person. And I remember telling him, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to be able to heal myself from headaches, but it stopped working when I stopped believing in it. And, uh, of course, he had a completely different interpretation of what that was about. But um, as an adult now, I look back and I think that it's funny how it only works for things that really were not that serious to begin with, <laughs> you know, or you, you know, you go to the doctor and he heals you, but you praise God anyway, you know. Um, 
That was another thing about the church that I went to. Many people may have heard of Christian science in the context of big news stories where someone has you know, died as a result of lack of health care. And that certainly does happen, but it never happened in my church. I never heard of that kind of thing when I was growing up. Almost all of the families that I knew in our Christian science church had at least one family member, like a father or an uncle, who was not a Christian scientist, and they would insist that the children be taken for medical care when something was needed. So almost everyone had some sort of um, intervention if they had a serious issue. I did go to urgent care when I sliced my foot open. I did go to the hospital when I broke my collarbone. Those things all happened, but we did not get vaccinated. And I had a religious exemption, so I didn't take biology in high school. <laughs> and that still bothers me because occasionally people are talking about clades and families. And I'm like, why don't I understand that? And I go, oh, yeah, because I didn't take biology. <laughs> so it sounds like there was a measure of quite a measure of, of sheltering there. Uh, that's that's crazy. It, although I I do understand it in part because a lot of Protestant groups, uh, they wouldn't see things perhaps the same way on a lot of those levels, but they would still say there's this world system that's dominated by the devil and it's dominated by ungodly secular people like, you know, like awful people like us. And that we are just out to, you know, uh, steal their children from being good little soldiers for Jesus. And so the best thing you can do is to create uh, what we used to call a hedge of protection. We used to pray, God put a hedge of protection around us and you'd shelter them. And it would include literally things like we're not going to that, like you, you public schools are the enemy and uh, things like, you know, you're not going to play or be too close with those friends that are, you know, Buddhist or whatever, or, or Catholics, uh, you know, we're going to stay close and we're going to do a lot of things so that you're always with people who believe just like us. But then also evolution, which, you know, related to biology there, just we wouldn't, if, if evolution were ever brought up, it was always in the context of like, now we're going to tell you how these ridiculous, stupid, atheistic scientists think, and then we're going to tell you why they're completely wrong. And let's get back to creation science and why the earth is 6,000 years old. And so it was like, it would just poison the well exponentially, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that that happens a lot, particularly nowadays. Um, that was not the case where I grew up. Um, we were not taught that we weren't allowed to believe in evolution. Nobody did, nobody contested that. Uh, we weren't taught that uh, the world was evil and that we should not, you know, associate with people who weren't members of our church. That was not part of it. Our church was so small that if we had tried to only associate with members of our church, we really wouldn't talk to anyone because uh, we had maybe maybe 200 people in our church at most. Um, There's a small church. Uh, and it was just was gentler. I don't think my mother or our church community saw the world as dangerous necessarily. I mean, this was the 80s. We used to, well, 70s and 80s, we used to play outside and we'd be out. The kids would wander down to the park that was eight blocks away and we'd show up after, you know, the after it was dark and get in trouble because we didn't notice the sun going down and it happens gradually. Right. But they're like, when this, when it's dark, you need to be home. I'm like, yeah, but it was still light when I thought about it. So, I mean, we just played in the neighborhood and it was no big deal. Um, it, there wasn't yet, at least in our community, my experience was not that the world is evil and dangerous and that you must be protected in these very extreme ways. That wasn't happening for me. Um, the other thing that was a little bit different for us is these ideas of of hellfire and damnation and being a you know original sin and being a born a sinner these things were far less extreme if i mean they're in the bible so i don't think anyone would say that it's not true but it was very de-emphasized we were taught that um we were taught that the bible was inspired and not necessarily literal so we were had a lot of leeway to take things metaphorically. And um, I don't remember a lot of discussion about exactly what hell was supposed to be, but but that's kind of the point. It wasn't emphasized. Hell was not something that we were taught to be terrified of and live our lives in order to avoid. That wasn't really it. Um, the emphasis was more about we want you to be able to see the world the way God sees it and to have that purity of mind so that all of your troubles will naturally disappear. You know, um, we were taught we were all children of God and that we were all valuable in that way. So it was a little bit more of the the lightness and, and love side. 
uh, and a lot less of the hellfire and brimstone side in my experience. So did they have any thing at all that they would emphasize about, you know, what I would lump in the categories of blood magic and scapegoating, like you need a substitute for your sin for the punishment or else it's, you know, obviously bad news. D did that come into the equation much apart Not from just I... literally reading verses that say that? Not really. And I, I think they made an effort to focus on the passages that were reinforced by Mary Baker Eddy's thoughts. Um, and it was really mostly about healing that I recall. I mean, obviously, I was not nearly as studious as my mother wanted me to be. Um, so there may have been things that I missed. But I certainly did not walk away with that impression that you know, I didn't I didn't get scarred by my experience the way a lot of people did. I didn't walk away the, with the impression that uh, I was, you know, this filthy sinner that had to be, uh, you know, was only alive by the grace of God. I didn't I don't remember the blood magic stuff. We certainly didn't do communion or anything like that. I did attend, you know, a Catholic church uh, later with, you know, uh, my husband's family with, was Catholic and I got to experience that, which was really interesting. Um but yeah, I don't remember any of that being a big deal in our church. It really was just read your read your lesson, um, you know, try to see the world the way God sees it, and hopefully all your problems will disappear. That was the main message that I absorbed. They probably tried to teach me many other things, but the, I didn't get them <laughs> if there was from, more. <laughs> from an outsider's perspective, you know, a thousand foot view, not not knowing a lot of the nuance and detail that you probably could dive into. But just from what you've said so far, it sounds like there was a huge chance that people who went through those churches did not go through anywhere near as much religious trauma as the people that I would have, you know, associated with and, and been involved with. Because, you know, that the, the hell thing is a big deal. The idea that if you don't believe like us, you know, bad things are happening. Uh, angels and demons, you know, there's demons that are trying to get you into the bad stuff and mm -hmm. uh, just all kinds of ways in which the blessing and cursing, you know, if you do it God's way, he'll bless you. If you don't, he's going to get you really badly and endless stories of that in the Old Testament. But it sounds like your your experience was a lot more benign. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't perfectly benign, but it's like there was a lot less than the groups I'm used to. Can I ask just, was there anything though that as you do reflect on it, was there anything that you do think did fit into the arena of religious trauma Besides, obviously, like the just the false ideas of like, if you can, you know, claim this from God and see the world God's way, he's going to heal you. Obviously, that's a, a bunch of hooey. But apart from just the pure error, was there anything that like attacked you and your identity personally that you can recall? Not from the religion directly. Um, this is something I've thought about a lot because I've done a few interviews and I get asked this question. Really, my religious experience was quite benign, and I'm very fortunate in that respect. But there were subtler, more cultural influences. For instance, um, my mother and father got divorced when I was three. He was in Vietnam. He came back, you know, deeply wounded. And so they got divorced as soon as he came back, pretty much. Um, and then my mother, it was the 70s, she thought she had to be married. And she had three kids and she thought she had, she was supporting us just fine. She was a professional musician, but she thought she had to be married. And so she married this guy a couple of years after she got divorced. And she thought it was a great idea. And I could not stand this person. And he turned out to be pretty unstable. He was never diagnosed as far as I know, but there's, there were some indications that may, he may have been, um, either bipolar or, um, you know, possibly, had some other issues, possibly some symptoms of narcissism, but he was not nice to us. And he wasn't always nice to her either. And this was this was where my personal trauma came from, was from our experiences with him. And she stayed married to him until he died when I was 18. And now she's married to an, another person who's completely wonderful and and I and, and he's a great guy. But uh but her second husband was um not a not a great choice in retrospect. And she did it because of the cultural expectation that women needed to be married and that children had to have a father and that that was somehow better than any other alternative. 
and it was not great for us. And if she had believed that it was okay for be, her to be a single mom or even to just wait for a while until she found the right person, or even if she had had the right information to notice red flags and realize that this person was not the right father for her kids, then things would have been different for me and for my brothers. Yeah, it seemed like that that was a big carryover to it. Less that aspect, but just the idea of you just don't get divorced. That was mm -hmm. the, the upcoming sort of a corollary. You know, once you're married, if there is abuse, if there are issues, just you don't, God hates divorce. So don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sad, in, sad. I believe at that time, of course, I was a child, but my understanding is that when a lot of soldiers came back from Vietnam during that time, it was very difficult for the soldiers and for the families. And so I believe that was when divorce started to become a little bit more common because there really was almost no way to avoid it. It was so bad um, for so many people. And my mom was caught up in that trend. It was that was partly what happened to her. Mm. You mentioned uh, Scientology. How mm -hmm. did you get into that? Like what what was ex exploring that like? Because that that seems like a, a strange area to go. in. But I, I guess I can see some corollaries to, to Christian science. But what, what particularly got caught your attention with that group? Well, I studied philosophy in college, and I was always interested in pop psychology and, and um, you know, I'm just sort of into this sort of stuff. And I've always been looking for ways to be personally more, I don't know, evolved, calmer, saner, and also to sort of have guidance in my life. One thing that I remember feeling is when my kids were little and we were broke all the time and it was just really stressful being alive. Um, I remember admiring my religious friends and family because they seemed so serene. Like they seemed like they had it all figured out. And it, even if they were wrong, sometimes they felt like they had guidance in their lives. They had something or someone they could turn to to tell them what to do, and they could feel confident that they were doing the right thing. And I uh, envied that. So I started kind of looking around and I read some books and I, you know, had heard about this is before the Internet, you understand. So I didn't have I couldn't just Google it. I had to like go and check it out. So I I think I found Dianetics on a book sh bookstore shelf or something. And um, and so I read that and there happened to be a local Scientology center not too far from our house. So my husband and I took our little kids and we we trundled off and we attended a few times and uh, we attended their Sunday services a few times. And I thought it was interesting. And what attracted me was this idea that it was it was like psychology, right? It, they they build themselves as a way for you to um, sort of bypass or heal the things that were causing you to be irrational and unhappy. And I thought, well, I want that. Let me check it out. So I read a bunch of books. That, there are a lot of books on the Scientology bookshelf. I read probably eight or ten of them, uh, maybe more. And we did uh, a couple of auditing sessions where you sit down and you do these things where you ask these other, other questions. And, um, you know, we kind of went through a course where they taught you how to do that. And honestly, after doing that for a while, I just realized that it wasn't having the advertised effect. There were a lot of interesting things about it, but it, it, it wasn't actually working in the way I wanted it to work. I didn't. I didn't feel saner. I didn't feel happier. I didn't feel like I'd had any breakthroughs. So I was like, next. And uh, so I started looking elsewhere. That was my experience with Scientology. <laughs> I now, love I've that. Heard, I'm sorry, good. I was just going to say, I've heard since then that many other people had way, way more difficult experiences with it. But I, I realized it wasn't for me early enough that I got out before it got sucked into the really scary stuff. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. That's, yeah, I've heard some scary stories. There's some interesting interviews on uh, Derek Lambert's channel, Myth Vision. I'm sure you know that channel. And mm -hmm. some stories of people that have uh, even, I think, high level people from that group that have gotten out and shared their stories. But yeah, scary stuff. I love how you're mentioning the idea like it just doesn't work. Because I think that was one of the biggest things that helped me not to finally escape. My, my, my main escape from Christianity was I had to wait until I dove deep into comparative mythology. That was the only thing that got me out. I had all kinds of reasons I could have gotten out earlier, and none of them were enough. I kept on defaulting to a very strong theological background, mm -hmm. but uh, comparative mythology did, did thankfully get me out. Mm -hmm. But 
having said that, there were a bunch of little like precursor things that kind of said something's wrong here. One of them was exactly what you're just talking about, where you're just like the joy of the, it said the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And mm-hmm. I haven't felt joy in years. Mm-hmm. And you could say, oh, well, maybe you're entertaining sin, but like, no, this is not a sin issue. This is this is just, I don't feel very joyful. And I would see other people who were completely neck deep in church and listening to Christian radio nonstop. And there were some of the most cantankerous, ugly people you'd met. I'm like, if if this is what being around the gospel means that you become this ugly in your personality, in your character, this isn't what I want. And it really helped me a lot to, to kind of let those early seeds keep germinating just to say this doesn't add up. Uh, even simple mm-hmm. things like I, I just didn't see God showing up in some ways. I had medical things where I was like, God, if, if, if you could fix this, I could be in church on Sunday. But because you don't fix it, I have to constantly work to make enough money to pay for my medicines and this and that. Like, I literally can't go to your, your church because you won't help me get better. And it just, it didn't add up. It just didn't add up. Like, you just got want me in church or doesn't he? But, mm-hmm. you know, when you eventually put those pieces together, it helps you to start to think through like, yeah, maybe there's, maybe I'm missing something here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's interesting because I was not indoctrinated and I didn't have that fear and that um, habit of blocking any questions and doubts. It was much easier for me to be skeptical. I do remember uh, when I took my very first philosophy class in college, I think it was 1987. Um, I remember I loved philosophy. I thought it was great. And we were talking about these different ideas. For those of you who hasn't, haven't taken a philosophy class, what you do is you examine the ideas that different philosophers have and you just talk about them and you just examine life from different viewpoints because people have different ideas. And I remember having a discussion like this in class and we had a couple of people, you know, get really strange looks on their face and go, but but that's not what the Bible says. That can't be right. And I remember looking at them thinking, do you not understand the exercise that we're doing here. We're not asking if it's true. We're just discussing the possibility of these different viewpoints. And some people really seemed unable to look at the world from any perspective at all other than what they were taught. And of course, I realize now that that's not an accident. People are very carefully cultivated to be averse to any idea that isn't exactly what they were taught in church, which is too bad, you know. Yeah, very scary. It's amazing too how they're, they're really good at grooming children. Like they know that if you get them while they're young, you've got them in many ways, both in terms of like just tricking them to think that this mythology is real, but also that all of these bad things will happen if you don't follow suit with our, our perspective and belief system. What was, I know it's kind of related, but the law of attraction, what, what, what got you into that? And what, what did that do for you at that time? All right. This is this is funny. Again, this stemmed from my just extreme stress. And a lot of it was financial stress um, when my kids were little. And I this friend that I mentioned before who was into like new age uh, kind of stuff, he had this uh, series of uh, CDs that were the audio book of The Science of Getting Rich by Waddle, Wallace J. Waddles. And he sent them to me and I was like, all right, whatever, I'll read it. I need some money. Let's see if the science of getting rich works. So this was written in the, gosh, I think 1920s. I forget now. But um, so I listened to the book and it's it's short enough and it's pithy enough. It's it's got a pretty clear message. Um, And the message is basically if you visualize it, you can bring it into your life. Um, It became called Law of Attraction later um Wallace J Waddles just calls it the science of getting rich there was a movement uh, about 15 years ago called the secret that Oprah was very instrumental in spreading so yep. that is the same idea and it's it's very similar to what Mary Baker Eddy said it's all part of this new thought movement which is a bunch of people during the golden industrial age saying, hey, guess what? It's really easy to make money if you just think about it. Or, you know, you should be able to be healthy if you just think about it. Like they all were basing it on the Bible. But my personal this now I haven't read analysis, but my personal guess is that it's just because they were living in an age where things were much better than they ever had before. These particular people were living fairly privileged lives. And they thought it was easy because they had found a secret when, in fact, it was easy because they just happened to be very lucky. Um, But that didn't stop them from writing books and telling everyone else how easy it is. So 
there was definitely a parallel between the science of getting rich and Mary Baker Eddy's The Science of uh, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which was what Christian science was. Um, and there's also a parallel with Scientology, too. Like all of these were people who thought they had figured something out, um, that they knew something that other people didn't understand and that they could share it. And it turned out to be bullshit on all counts <laughs> for the most part. I mean, there can there's a grain of truth in almost everything. Uh, looking back, I'm kind of embarrassed that I spent so much time studying the science getting of getting rich, but it was because I found an online forum. This is when the internet was just getting started, and there was this lovely online forum that was dedicated to discussing the science of getting rich book, and it was hosted by this lovely woman named Rebecca Fine, who wasn't trying to sell anything. She wasn't trying to aggrandize herself. She was just hosting this forum so people could talk about it. And it was a really great group of people. And I'm kind of a de diligent student. So, you know, I wanted to go on there and explain how I understood it and ask people questions and and do all this. So I literally was involved in that for like five years <laughs> until I finally realized that it was absolute and complete bullshit. <laughs> and I can actually tell you how I figured it out. My mentor sent me a book, an ebook called, gosh, I think it was called E squared or something. I still have it in my phone. I could look it up, but it was supposed to be a series of exercises that proved to you that the law of attraction works. Right. And I remember, I only remember one of the exercises. I started reading it and I kind of, I'm going through it. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And then there's one exercise where she talks about, okay, think of a specific car, a specific color of car and watch and see how often you see that color of car. See, it works. You brought it into your life. And I was like, are you kidding me? Oh my, oh my freaking gosh. I don't know if I can curse on here, but wow. Like this was it struck me almost like a bolt of lightning. This is confirmation bias. This is so obviously motivated reasoning. How could I have fallen for this? If this is all it is, I am wasting my time. Mm. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a grain of truth. Sure, uh, if you are not, you know, if you've got your eyes on the ground or on your phone and there happens to be a $20 bill blowing by, you will miss it because you weren't looking for it for sure. But you're not going to manifest a $20 bill blowing by just by thinking about it. It would have to be happening anyway. Right. And uh, it is it is mortifying to me that it took me so long to catch on. But I'm glad I finally did. Yeah. I love how you keep saying like there's there's little nuggets of of something that might be useful or, or true but it's it's and I, I haven't honestly dove into the law of attraction more than like five minutes so I, I i'm very ignorant of it but i do like the idea that if i can grab something good that i think they would espouse it's just the idea that what whatever you are like-minded people are going to kind of be attracted to you so for example if you're you know seeing in yourself that you're grumpy and you're irrit irritable and you're like that's not who i want to be well, if you start changing, you're becoming positive and happy. And when life goes, doesn't go your way, you're just like, you know what? It is what it is. I'm still going to put a smile on my face. I'm not going to make everybody pay for it and be a, be a horrible person about it every day. I'm just going to make something good out of what I can. You start to be more joyful in and of yourself. Obviously, people that are trying to be more, you know, uh, misery, misery guts are going to be like that, that person doesn't, I can't drag them down to my miserable level. They keep trying to turn it into like a Pollyanna. Like a, do you know the movie Pollyanna from Disney? Oh, yes. I'm very familiar with it. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies. I've seen it so many times. I love that mentality of like play the glad game. Mm -hmm. Find some way to be happy about something. Uh, you know, make 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 whatever the expression is, turn lemons into lemonade, but make something beautiful of whatever you've got. And that's always been an inspiration to me, especially from that movie, Pollyanna. And I do think that that reality is true, that when you are that kind of person, obviously people who are like that are going to be like, I want that, that that's a good person for me. They, they build me up, they pull me up, they don't push me down. So there's like, there's little nuggets of that. But yeah, when you get much deeper to it, where it's, it gets into spiritual woo woo, and especially if they're like, you can manifest, you know, you can become a millionaire in the next year if you just think about it long enough. It's like, yeah, no, that's, that's not how it works. And there's a yeah, lot of, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of scams that play into that too. Oh, Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute, but I want to add to what you said about Pollyanna. I think that there are a couple of ways of looking at it, and one is maybe more useful than the other. There definitely is a movement of 
toxic positivity where people are you know, told that you have to be positive all the time. One of the most damaging things that we were taught in the science of getting rich is that uh, your actions are not as effective if you don't do them out of a sense of joy and enthusiasm, which was mm. petrifying to me because I was running a small business. I had a lot of stuff to do and I was afraid that they would be un ineffective that I would be ineffective as a person and a, a business owner if I couldn't find a way to be happy about every single thing that I was doing. A lot of the stuff is just a, a real grind and not fun. Like I'm a creative person and I had to do a lot of, you know, paperwork and, you know, that was not fun for me. And so I, I was really worried that my attitude was going to affect my effectiveness. And of course, I you know, since then, the toxic positivity movement has been unveiled a little bit, and we now understand more how damaging that is when you try to force yourself to ignore how you're really feeling and try to pretend yourself into being happy. That only works, you know, it it can it can there are some good things about the idea, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it also can be, be extremely damaging when, again, it's that victim blaming. It's your fault because you weren't positive enough. It's your fault because you weren't happy enough. People don't like you because you're grumpy all the time, that sort of thing. Um, so that I think it, we need to be very careful of and not punish ourselves for not being happy all the time because that's not how you humans are. Um, on the other hand, there I believe there are things that we can do to help ourselves be more um, healed and healthy and to learn emotional hygiene and learn, um, you know, personal development and things that we can do, go to therapy and journal and, you know, mindfulness and things that we can do that actually do calm our amygdala and help us process our emotions and help us be actually really healthier people and that makes it much easier for us to have a positive inner you know a positive uh, impact on the world because we're healthier people not because we're pretending to be healthier people i think it's important for us to have an eye out for the distinction between those things it's a it's a blurry line but i try as much as possible to acknowledge my emotions and give them room to breathe and not try to shove them to the side in an effort to constantly be this positive person. Yeah. It's so funny. There's that's a, all I wanted to say about that. That's a great point. There's, it, you may make you think too, but of a Christian song we used to sing a lot uh, where it's th that the, the, the toxic positivity was really reinforced. It's uh, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. You know that one? I remember that song. And we sing it at camp. Yeah. yeah. And it even ends. I think in one, one of the verses ends it. And, and now I am happy all the time. And it's like, yeah. yeah, that's not reality. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it was a fun song to sing, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> so you you eventually got also pulled into some Protestant church exposure. Uh, I was going to ask about that at some point. So that's, this is a good point to bring that in. Uh, did, how did you get involved? And was that, you know, tip like liberal Protestant where you're talking about like Episcopalian stuff or like, you know, Baptist, you, you know, you, Hellfire Brimstone? Like what was your exposure like with the Protestants? Well, we went to several and it was a little of both categories. Uh, again, this was part of our attempt to find that confidence that religious people had. Plus, our kids were still little. And I, I still had this idea that somehow you make your kids better people by taking them to church. I, I no longer think that's true. But at the time, it was just sort of what you did. And that's how you feel like you're being a good parent. So uh, my husband is, is was Catholic, and I grew up Christian science, and neither one of us really wanted to go back to that. Scientology didn't work out, so we thought, well, let's try some of these other churches. Uh, some of them were uh, really awful, actually. I remember people were always super nice when we walked in, right? Everyone is super, super nice, right? So you think, wow, this is great. People are so nice here. I remember we went to one church. It was a fairly large church, and the preacher at one point told the ushers to stand in front of the door and use their best karate stance because he didn't want anyone leaving. And then he proceeded to give a sermon on how LGBTQ people were not okay. And it was a sin. And, and he had very specifically, you know, asked people to block the door so that we couldn't get up and walk out. Otherwise we would have, like we would have get, gotten up and walked out conspicuously. 
um, if he, you know, if he had not made an effort to block the doors, I was livid. And uh, my husband is much more conflict averse than I am. And so he was sort of grabbing my wrist saying, just don't get up, don't get up. I almost got up anyway. I was so incensed. Um, that is absolutely not okay with me. Yeah. Um, wow. So that was one experience. We had another experience where we walked in and they literally just gave the floor to a uh, conservative Republican politician and let him give his stump speech right there in church on Sunday morning. That time I did get up and walk out. Uh, we well, went I imagine to another... they still kept their tax exemption. <laughs> even oh, after yeah. That. Oh, yeah. No one ever challenges that. They do really whatever they want. It is it is fully and clearly illegal and unconstitutional, but they just do it anyway. Um, but I walked out because I wasn't going to sit there for that. Um, so there was another church that we went to that was actually quite lovely. Uh, this was some sort of a, a, a some sort of a unified church. I actually don't even remember what it was anymore, but they were very LGBTQ friendly. They were very open to conversation. I thought that the pastor said some very interesting things in his sermons. He was more intellectual, more academic, and I really enjoyed that. I liked that conversation. Uh, but we stopped going mostly because it was just too far away from us. It was it was about a 45 minute drive and we just got to where we preferred to sleep in on Sundays. But, you know, after a while, I finally became exposed to uh, atheist YouTube. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there are people happily living their lives without any belief in any supernatural entities. And they're doing just fine. I can do it, too. I don't have to be religious in order to be happy or to be a good person. I can do it. So I just settled, you know comfortably into atheism at that point mm, that's awesome so cool um with when you did that get to that point though could i ask was there any part of you that was thinking that you were in danger like th there's all that fear factor that you may have not bought into and had it you know shoved down your your intellectual throat but just that background of like maybe they are deceived and maybe this is actually evidence of demonic deception you know maybe hell is real did any of that come in or were, was it like so benign to go back to that word that it just didn't matter yeah not really i didn't have that kind of seed of fear instilled in me as a child um that's so cool i i know i'm very lucky i'm sorry for those of you that did have that instilled i would just remember when people would say extreme things like oh it's the devil talking to you i would just scoff i'm like you're I mean, no, I don't think so. I remember somebody asking me, uh, well, what if you're wrong? What if you show up at the pearly gates and it turns out that you were wrong the whole time? What are you going to do then? And I said, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> like, I just don't think that's going to happen. You know, it's amazing, too, that when people bring those kind of things up, that they're not putting together the pieces that a God that would judge you for trying to be intellectually honest and saying the pieces for your Christian worldview don't make sense, uh, that is clearly mythology or it's clearly uh, based on some very bad ideas like blood magic and scapegoating, that you would say, I'm trying to be intellectually honest, so God's going to penalize me forever in a torture chamber that he created because I couldn't believe something that was unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. Like, And, and you're going to call that guy a good, good father, a loving, tender-hearted father. Like, you know, if, if that, fortunately, Yahweh is not real, but if Yahweh had been real, if the Yahweh character were real, then you would not be in a spot where you should worship him and love him. You should be in a spot to basically curse him uh, to your dying breath, if you could. And if he's going to torture you for that, like, there's no way to call that guy a good father. And I, mm -hmm. I shudder to think about the fact that that's, that reality for myself and other Christians never really hits home while you're in it. I mean, you, you go into these big worship services and they're playing this beautiful music this God is, God is a good, good father. He just loves you. Let his, you know, let his loving kindness just wash over you and heal you. And it's like, holy smokes. Like this is a guy that says, I love you to no end, but if you don't love me back, I will torture you forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I appreciate going back to that concept too. Like if you were say, you know, uh, girls, you know, expressing joy that she's engaged. Like, yeah, I just got engaged everybody. Oh, tell us what it was like. Oh, well, he gave me this ring. And he said, you know, he loved, he'll love me forever. But he also said that if I don't, you know, accept the ring, 
that he's going to beat the shit out of me with a baseball bat. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. <laughs> like, uh, no, <laughs> call the police. Like, come on. It's, your, your God is a psychopathic, abusive narcissist. Mm -hmm. And it just, they don't, they don't connect the dots. I didn't connect the dots. It's you're, when you're in it, you don't see it. Oh yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and, and of course we're not the first to notice that metaphor with, you know, the God, as it's described in many churches is very similar to an abusive person, an abusive father. Right. But children love their abusive fathers, right? Because that's, it's in our natures to love our parents and to believe them and accept them and to try to please them so that they'll care for us. That's sort of you know, an evolutionary adaptation. And so it's normal and natural for us to believe these things. And when you're taught it from birth, it's, it's very easy to be caught up in that and not notice that it's, it's terrible and abusive and awful, you know? And I think that there can be so much damage done to someone by being told that they are sinful by nature and that they're unworthy that it is easier for them to believe that they've done something wrong than to believe that their parent or their god has done something wrong yeah you know it's it's very it's very sad and i, I hate that so many people in the world have grown up with this damage and i hope for all of them and for you that the healing is possible for sure. Thank you so much. And speaking of uh, parenting, the topic of parenting, I did want it's a good segue um, to go to the topic of how did your thought process on all this stuff affect your parenting in terms of like when your kids would maybe ask questions about, you know, do, when the dog dies, did the dog go to doggy heaven? Is there a heaven for me? You know, did aunt so-and-so go to heaven? Um, like when you bring up the, you know, these life existential questions uh, or, the, or the kids do, obviously it's a very different conversation when you're not stuck in uh, you know a fundamentalist religion how did you all deal with those conversations and even questions as simple as like why do i have to be good if i'm not going to be judged in the afterlife for it you know like why do, why does my morality matter if, if there's nothing no rewards or punishment afterwards how did you handle some of those parenting conversations well first of all i i never wanted to lie to my kids i didn't lie to them about anything we you know we we did pretend you know like we pretended there was a santa claus but if they questioned it i didn't try hard to like make them continue to believe and when they asked questions i tried to answer them as honestly as i could and i think in retrospect from what i know now i probably would have been less open about my personal beliefs, I probably would have said, well, some people think this and some people think that. And what do you think? And treated them more the way we treat our clients here now uh, at Recovering from Religion and just encouraging them to come up with their own conclusions. But at the time, I was pretty direct. And I said, uh, no, I don't think that's true. Yes, I think that's true. This is what I believe. Um, some people say this or that, but I think they're wrong. You know, that's the sort of thing I said. Um, our kids did did experience, you know, death of pets and things like that when they were young. And we never tried to pretend that the pet was still alive in heaven. We just said, no, I'm sorry that that pet is gone. We're going to bury him in the backyard and give it a funeral service. And and I'm sorry, it's very sad. It's awful. But this happens sometimes. And, you know, that's that's just how we handled it. Um you know, they seem to have been okay. They they both grew up fairly skeptical. I remember when my younger son was going to high school, uh, he was going to the same school where my husband taught, and it's rural Texas. We had at least one science teacher who had a intelligent design poster up in her classroom, and my husband went to the the counselor and said, please don't put my son in her room. He will cause problems <laughs> because my son is not shy and he will tell you what he thinks. And uh, we didn't really want him to get in a position where he was fighting with his teacher. So we just put him in a different science classroom and it was all okay. <laughs> He's fine. <laughs> have but, you seen that uh, show young, young Sheldon? I have not seen it. No. It, it, would, it would fit in that category of like, w we know a little bit more than this this teacher does, and we actually could kind of debunk you and make you look bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My husband was very keen to avoid that kind of a conversation. I would have been okay with it, but it, you know, he 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 found a way around it, so our son didn't have to, you know, contradict his teacher in front of the whole class. Mm, that's awesome. Well, in terms of uh, going back to your your story, I would love to kind of hear how you got involved with 
recovering from religion and obviously, you know, tell us more about, you know, what, what they do and so forth. But how did you get involved? What compelled you to feel like, you know, you could make such a big difference and, and a bigger footprint with this uh, community? And if you could also uh, tell us a little bit about some of the the harder and more painful parts of it as you pick up, you know, as you connect with all these different communities, there's obviously some real big aches and pains and even threats and people losing relationships, people getting cut off, especially in the, the, the what I would, I, all Christianity is a cult to me, but the, the cultish, more cultish ones where it's like, if you don't believe like us, we're literally not going to talk to you. Like you might, yeah. might not even talk to your own children. Um, like mm -hmm. if you could explain, you know, as you go through your, your story with RFR, like, what is it like? What are the, some of the pain points you're seeing in, in people's journeys? Mm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot out there. Our st I'll start with how I actually became involved. I I actually don't remember how I first heard of Recovering from Religion. It was probably on some atheist podcast. A lot of people hear about us from the Atheist Experience or from one of Matt Dillahunty's shows. So shout out to Matt. He does promote us quite a lot. And it's it's possible that I heard it from him. Um, but I remember at the end of 2020... The election had just finished and I was exhausted. It was just a really rough past five years. And uh, here in the United States, it was pretty bad. And I just remember thinking, I, I, I can't do politics anymore. I had tried to volunteer at local politics and that did not work out for a lot of reasons. But um, I just wanted to do something to feel like I was making any kind of a difference. And so I thought... Um, I thought, okay, let me just check out this Recovering from Religion place and see if maybe I can help out there. So I applied and was accepted at the end of 2020. I did my training through the holidays of 2020, and I took my very first helpline client on January 2nd, 2021, and I have not looked back. I've just gotten more and more involved since then, as you can probably tell from my bio. Um but my first volunteer assignment was working on the helpline, which is um, has two ways to contact Recovering from Religion. You can call a phone number. It's 184-I-DOUBT-IT, uh, or there are several other phone numbers depending on which country you're calling from. There's web call, so you can call from anywhere in the world as long as you have the internet, and it doesn't have to cost you phone minutes. Um, and we also have a chat line, so there's a little green chat bubble on the homepage, and you can chat in with an agent um, to talk about whatever's on your mind. So um, I did both calls and chats. And um, there are all kinds of different people that that contact the helpline. Some of the more heartbreaking stories are young people. Um, I remember we had one young man who was living in a very isolated area with his mother who was highly religious. He was, I, I believe he was uh, an older adolescent or a younger man. We didn't ever find out exactly how old he was, but his mother treated him like a child. He did not have any transportation and she didn't even have a car. Occasionally she would go into town with friends who lived somewhat close by for groceries or, or, or what have you and, and leave him alone in the house, which is when he would contact us. Um, but he didn't see any way out. She wanted him to, I think he was homeschooled and, and she wanted him to join whatever her home-based business was when he was finished with school. And he just saw absolutely no way for him ever to escape. And all we could do was just listen to him and try to validate his experience and tell him that it wasn't his fault that he was in the situation and, um, you know, that he wasn't the only one who was questioning the religious uh, precepts that his mother was telling him. And, and eventually um, he stopped calling and we don't know what happened to him. So, um, you know, those can be really difficult when you don't know the end of the story. You can imagine something really bad may have happened. On the other hand, maybe he stopped calling because it, things got better for him and he didn't need us anymore. So um, those kinds of stories are really rough. We get contacted by people who are in Muslim communities where their lives could literally be in danger if people found out that they were no longer uh, fully in belief of the precepts or didn't want to do what they're told. A lot of times they have arranged marriages or it's just expected that they must marry someone, you know, within a certain time period before they reach a certain age. And it must be someone from their religious community. And um, maybe they have, you know, uh, 
a love a love interest who is not part of the community and they're terrified. They don't know what to do. Their parents will kick them out of the house. Their community might attack them. They could be physically in danger. That's really, really hard to talk to people like that because there's only so much we can do. Um, there are other organizations that provide help with asylum and things like that, but um, we can just refer them to that. But of course, we don't actually, we're not the ones that can like send you money to get you out of the country or something like that. We'd have to refer you to another organization. Those are very difficult. Um, you mentioned shunning and the Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses are um, the ones that I'm aware of that are the most extreme in terms of shunning. For most people who are um, part of the organization and have been baptized within the organization and are considered full-fledged Jehovah's Witnesses, if they leave the religion, their entire family and community and all of their friends are required to shun them and never speak to them again. So if someone is in that position and they are thinking, if they're having doubts about their belief and they're thinking of maybe, I don't know, maybe cutting down on going to church or maybe you know, not doing all the proselytizing they're expected to do, they are in danger of losing everything they've ever known. And when you talked about being sheltered, a lot of these people are so sheltered, they don't know anybody else. They've been taught not to associate with people of the world. They've been taught not to get a job, not to go to college, because the end is coming any minute. They need to put all of their attention on, you know, saving souls and just doing all the things that the Jehovah's Witnesses ask them to do. So they have no other life, and they have a very, very narrow perspective on what's available for them should they leave. Um, and to be honest, there isn't always a great soft landing place for people. Um, you know, it's not like we have a wonderful social safety net here in the United States. Um, it's better in some other countries and worse in others. But, you know, it's not necessarily going to be easy for them. It's going to be hard either way. So quite often we're the ones that people will turn to and say, I just don't know who to talk to. I don't know what to do next. And our role is to support them and help guide them through the process, whatever they decide to do. It's amazing when you when you look at the the damage that religion has done. It just it's like wave after wave of these stories and examples, and even for people that can stay friends with their loved ones, like the internal battles of like I am, everyone hates me, and everyone thinks you know. They're even quoting verses like the fool has said in his heart, "There's no God," and so everyone sees you as the fool, and uh, you know, kind of treats you like a child. And I remember when I left, it was a, an awful lot of patronization. I, I remember. People are like, uh, the, the one that always gets me is like, I hope you find what you're looking for. Like as if I'm some <laughs> kind of lost soul because I don't, I don't need Jesus's magic blood. Like that yeah. makes my life so horrible, but it's just, it's so heartbreaking. I have interviewed a few JWs mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it gets to a point where you just think to yourself, I just, I just can't believe we're still dealing with this stuff after, you know, 2000 years after Jesus would have existed if he was real, like we're mm -hmm. still dealing with these these stories we're still dealing with this this far and not just the shunning but even things like patriarchy and other issues but like it's it's mm -hmm. it feels like it's time for our culture to evolve a little bit past this and you know grow up a little bit and it's like we're just we're still like infants that are just so afraid we're so afraid of what it looks like to be free of a mythology based worldview that we just we just have no scope for the imagination to think how good life can be and of course mm -hmm. we're dr drilled into you that it's going to be very scary if you leave and so once you leave, everyone mistreats you, but it's just, once you escape though, the thing that's hard for me to explain to people that are in it is like, once you escape, you just, you can't make yourself re-believe. Once you see the wizard behind the curtain, you can't just pretend like, oh, I didn't see him there. It's like, you know, he's there. You know that Jesus is based on copies of, you know, Dionysius and other Greco-Roman mystery cult gods. You know, this stuff is where it's coming from. And you can't force yourself, but it's almost like they want you to, they want you to force yourself to believe or they just have no, uh, no way to pro put, like, there's no category for you, especially when you look at the question of like people thinking, can you thrive after leaving a religion where they just assume like your life's going to get so horrible and messed up. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm doing quite fine. I'm thriving. Thank you very much. I'm doing just mm -hmm. great. They can't imagine that that's okay because to them, everything is like, your life's just going to get demonic and awful. Mm -hmm. And when you put these pieces together that way, I think to the, the implication for them that I've, I've really, several people have helped me think through it really well to say that if if you're right, meaning as, as a secular atheist person, if you're right, then the implication of that is number one, they're living a lie. Number two, they're probably not going to go anywhere when they die and they're not going to see their you know loved ones that have passed. 
and they're truly like wasting every minute of their lives, but also doing damage to other people. And even Paul says, if Jesus is not raised, we're of all people to be most pitied. I'm like, bingo, you are mm-hmm. of all people to be most pitied. <laughs> Christ yeah. has not been raised, yeah. but it's like, it's, it's, it's so, so sad. And you just, you just wish, I don't know if, you know, we'll see many enough progress in our lifetimes to feel like humanity is moving on, but you just, you just hope that within the next few hundred years, you know, thousand years that humanity can get past this stuff and say, we're, we're better than this. We're better than religion. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. And, you know, there are so many good reasons why people find it difficult to leave or even why they go back once, twice, several times, um, because, you know, there are so many things that religion offers or at least promises um, that it, it can be very seductive. You know, even if you weren't raised religious, if you are in need of community, if you're in need of guidance like I was, if you're in need of some sense of confidence that you're doing the right thing, if you if you're afraid that you don't have a moral framework to to teach your kids or if you just, uh, you know, need some sort of ritual or habit in your life so that you feel stable. Those are all reasons why people go to church. And once you get there, you're promised love and health and wealth and everlasting life and everything that you could ever possibly want is promised. Uh, And by the way, the uh, Christian churches are not the only ones that promise this. Almost all religions promise these things. The science of getting rich promises this, right? Scientology promises this. Um, You know, other religions that you might not consider Christian, like Mormons promise this. Like any, any organization that is willing to say what you want to hear is going to attract members and it's going to be attractive. So that is natural. And I don't think anyone should feel bad for wanting those things because they're normal. Um, The thing that we need to watch out for is whether or not they can deliver. And most of the time they can't. Hmm. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's such an important piece too for, for RFR as well as just the whole secular community to be wrapping our arms around people that are hurting as much as we can. And I love how there's so many Facebook groups now you can get plugged into so many places you can get help. And it, it really is a truism that you're going to lose a lot of friends over it when you leave, but there's a lot of people that will love you through it. If you can connect, you know, as quickly as you can, Mm -hmm. and they'll help you get grounded and help you think through the issues and also just help you eventually even get a voice on the other side. I mean, I I think of like my journey, there were people that were my inspiration to say, Tim, like, yeah, you escaped, but you you need to turn your eyes to the people that are still going through it. There's other people that need something. And so it's, it's amazing how many, how many of us find ourselves saying we need to get involved once we leave, because we know, we know how hard it hurts, how much it hurts and how difficult that journey out is. And uh, mm-hmm. people need, people need someone to walk them through, you know, that journey with them. I do think too, that um, one of the best things that's helped me is just getting more and more information. Like I love how now that we live in the information age, you can, it isn't just as simple as like, you just wanted to sin. You just wanted to, you know, not bow your knee to God. It's like, no, no, I can now educate myself on the mythology. I can educate myself on the Bible discrepancies. When you add it all up, I think that there's a better chance than ever for people, if they can find the time and the energy to get really educated, you can get to a point where you really can stand up for yourself. At first you feel like, everyone's attacking you got to you know explain yourself why are you leaving jesus but like eventually mm-hmm. you can turn the turn the table and eventually it gets to a point where they're in the hot seat where it's like what what are you doing defending genocide what are you doing mm-hmm. defending land theft and slavery and stoning and general mutilation and child brides what what the hell are you thinking like that's yeah. your religion sounds really awful now yeah. you you twist it and you put them on the hot seat and yeah. you know a lot of people are finding that they're <laughs> the education piece just gets them to the point where and it's it's ironic because then christians you see Christians don't want to necessarily engage anymore because they realize, you know, too much, you you become too powerful and too much of a threat. So like, I'm just going to walk away and not discuss this with you. He's like, yeah, because I I know, number one, I was in it. I know how the sausage is made, but I I now have a voice and you can't Mm -hmm. threaten me anymore. And uh, it's just, it's amazing when, when, once they lose their power, it's Mm -hmm. the the whole game changes. It's awesome. Well, in terms of your story, uh, I love to ask people kind of as a, maybe bringing us toward a wrap up. What are some of the projects and aspirations on your heart in terms of both personally and in your family, but also professionally? Like, how do you feel like your gifts and talents can you be, you know, broaden to make a bigger impact? 
Oh, that is such a big question. Um, I probably am not doing uh, as much as I could, um, but I I try. Um, <clears throat> a big part of my time is spent in recovering from religion, and I'm happy to talk about that as long as you want. There's so much that recovering from religion offers. It's been around for 15 years, and we have of course, we have the helpline, which is 24-7 support for anybody who has any questions. Um, and we don't tell you what to think. We're not here to proselytize or deconvert anyone. We're just they're here to support you and help you kind of get through whatever it is that you're um, going through. We have the support groups, which are, again, these are most of them online, but some are in person. There might be one in your local area. Oh, really? You can, you can like meet up with people physically? Yes. Yes. Okay. We do have some physical meetups. Um and uh, so, yeah, you can you can sit down with people and, and talk about what you're going through. And, and again, this is all peer led. It's not therapy, but it is very helpful for people to have an opportunity to talk to others um, and see that you're just not alone. You're not the only one going through it. We have like I said, we have over 45 support groups now. Many are online, but also a few are in person. We also have um, a vast database of resources that are accessible from our website that have been curated and they're on all topics. When people start to leave um, their religion or even just question or doubt what they've been taught, it tends to bring a lot of other things into question too. You know, you mentioned before things like science and evolution, um, but there's also things like, you know, the paranormal in general or, um, you know, morality is a big question. How do I raise my kids? How do I get along with people who are religious or, um, you know, how do I conversate, have a conversation with someone who's trying to proselytize to me? Or, you know, how do I get along with my, my parents? And there are all these questions that tend to come up that people just haven't thought of before. And sometimes they're things like, I don't even know how to make friends because I've only ever made friends in church. What do I do? So our database covers pretty much anything that you can think of that might be related to recovering from religion, including all the academic stuff, what's in the Bible, what's in the Quran, what's, you know, what's in the Book of Mormon, all the, uh, uh, most of that stuff is in there. And we're adding new stuff to it every day. So we recommend that people peruse mm -hmm. that if you have questions. Um, and our agents awesome. will be able, yeah, and our agents will be able to direct you to specific resources if you have certain concerns and questions too. And there's so many other things. Um, we've got a, a private online community Remember, I talked about the Science of Getting Rich forum that I was on. This is kind of similar to that, but it's very private. In fact, it's so private that you can't join just by clicking a link. Um, you have to be personally invited by a Recovering from Religion volunteer. And the easiest way to do that is just to contact the helpline and let them know that you've heard of the online Slack community and you would like to join. And they'll ask you a few questions to make sure you're a good fit. Um, the great thing about that online community is because it is so heavily guarded <laughs> Um, it's very safe and very supportive. You do not get trolls bombing in. You don't get people that just suddenly decide they want to proselytize to you. You don't get it. I mean, not that no one has ever snuck in, but it happens so rarely and we catch it so fast that you can be a lot more comfortable. Um, also, it's totally anonymous. No one asks you for your real name. No one asks you to, you know, show your picture. We don't ask you for your Instagram. We don't want to know who you are. We just want you to feel safe and protected in a place to talk to other people like yourself. So mm -hmm. um, we also have the fall excursion, which comes up every September. This year it's in uh, Virginia. And this is uh, Recovering from Religion's answer to the religious retreat. Um, we are instead, we have our fall excursion. You come out, you can smoke, you can drink, you can, well, sorry, there's no smoking. I shouldn't have said that. You can drink, you can curse. <laughs> you can hang out with people. We don't have a lot of rules. Uh, just be nice to everybody and uh, get to know each other and have a good time and learn some information about religious recovery that you may not have known before and sing karaoke and eat great food and stay up as late as you want and yeah, it's really, really fun. Well, you are very, very busy, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's an awesome list. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, th I think one of the things that I love to think about is just how you just obviously gave uh, an overwhelming list of things that you're involved in. And you can just, if I can borrow the Christian word, it's just going to bless the socks off of so many people. But I do love the idea of saying like, yeah, we know we all have talents. We all have gifts. They're not from Yahweh. But we do have things that make us thrive. We do have things that make us feel really happy to, you know, whether it's painting or making a song or volunteering somewhere, whatever you can do. But just to say there, there are ways that, you know, volunteering and and doing something for the community is going to help. And and I, I love that expression. I don't know who first came up with it. I think it was Brene Brown or something. But the idea of like you're when you tell your story, 
it becomes someone else's survival manual. And that that idea is, is so powerful, but being able to just in some way, get involved, share your story, share something, and you can make a difference in a way that you just, you don't know. It's like, I remember that in church, we'd have, have that illustration. A lot of somebody was walking along a beach and there's a whole bunch of starfish that are going to dry out because the sun's going to come out and just, just, they're going to be dead. But somebody was just tossing like one at a time in and someone says, you realize you can't save them all. I was like, yeah, I, I realize that. But to that one starfish that I threw back in the water, it makes the world a difference to them. And it's just, it's so true. You know, and people, people really need, they need the, the loving, loving arms. Like we're, we, the loving arms of Jesus aren't there. I'm sorry to say. Jesus has never, never had his arms around you, but there's a lot of humans, a lot of people around you in your community that really do love you and really do want to see you thrive and really do understand where you're going through, what you're going through and some of the pain points. So thank you for what you're doing. It's such a good example. I love, I, I got to, had the privilege of interviewing Daryl Ray a few months ago. That was awesome to talk to He's him. He's amazing. And yeah. He is. He blows my Darryl. mind. Yeah. He kind of yeah. like, he can kind of pick through what you say too and like analyze. He's like kind of sort of answering your questions, but also analyzing, why did you phrase your question that way? He's like, is he a good, mm-hmm. good analyst? But yeah, I was, yeah. was going to mention too, I was, I was privileged uh, and honored to be able to call on the line myself when I first deconverted. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. I called in twice and I think I got someone in England and then Australia, but it was good. It, 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 I think, you know, some people I think are probably going to be repeat callers and call a lot longer. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was getting, I had so many resources that, you know, two phone calls was enough for me, but it yeah. was really cool. And it's, you know, they just set up like, you know, Hey, we're, what, what's the best time for you? And you know, the, the one gentleman spoke with me for a good hour and a half. I think he just, and, and most of it honestly is like you kind of alluded to, they're not trying to convince you like, yeah, you're right. Christianity is garbage. They're not trying to push you one way or another. They're just trying to be a, a safe sounding board and saying, mm-hmm. how, how can we help you process this in a safe way, but with, with no mm-hmm. threats, but also no expectations. And for some people, just having a sounding board where you can just say, this is what I'm thinking. And it's it's a hundred percent safe. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's such a game changer. It really is. And you know what you said about Daryl is is no joke. He really knows what he's doing. And he set up this organization. Of course, he's a PhD level therapist and also an organizational psychologist. So um, and he's written four books. So uh, he set up recovering from religion kind of with his knowledge of psychology in mind. And he set up the training for the agents and all of us volunteers um, so that we understand what it is that people need at that stage. You know, Daryl knew and he said, look, you just have to learn how to listen. You have to learn how to rephrase and reflect and you have to learn how to support and help them uh, help them decide what they want to do without telling them what to do. And we have really incredible training. Being a part of this organization has made me a better person because um, I always wanted to be able to do those things, but it doesn't necessarily come naturally to me. So having that step-by-step guide and that philosophical framework for understanding what it is that people actually need in that situation is extremely helpful and has made me a better friend, a better parent, and a better wife. I think. Um, And I also wanted to say, um, Tim, you're definitely doing your part. And you and influencers like you are definitely helping to reach a hand down and help people who are in need of support and really, uh, you know, giving that that survival manual to people who are still in the really difficult part. Um, And for those of you who are in the difficult part, it doesn't last forever. It can be very, very hard. Uh, And for some people, it will get worse before it gets better. But there is light on the other side and there is love for you. And there are people who accept you for who you are and what you are and what you believe. And you don't have to fit into a tiny mold in order to be valuable in this world. Mm. Amazing. I love it. Can I get an amen? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, very well said. I don't think I could top that. Um, well, thank you so much. Yeah, I love I love being uh, doing what I do. It's an honor to host people's stories, and people's stories are so powerful. And you get the implication too through through so many of them that like you can make this ugliness beautiful. It's been uh, arguably very ugly in different ways. It's it's going to get better, and you're going to make it beautiful, and we'll do it together. Um, mm-hmm. Well, in terms of just recovering from religion, I do just want to mention real quick. Uh, I'll have a bunch of links beneath our video for how to connect. You know, if you just wanted to call and 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 talk to somebody like we've talked about. Or if you're, you know, in a spot where you can support them, you know, so forth. I'm sure they need as much support as we can give them. And I'm sure as well, if you're if someone that's able to consider volunteering, you know, get get plugged in there and connect them and connect and they'll talk about how you can get uh, to, to the volunteer level. But I just want to, again, plug Recovering from Religion. You all are doing great, great.
great work. And of course, the Secular Therapy Project, uh, the sister organization, uh, great stuff there. I've used them as well. Um, so it helps you to yeah. find someone that's not, you know, you, do, you don't want to get all the way out of Christianity and then say, I, I admit I need a therapist. So let's go talk to a fundamentalist Christian. Like, don't go there. That's yeah, you got to be it. careful about that. That's why the Secular Therapy Project exists, because there are a lot of people calling themselves psychologists or counselors when they are not doing psychology. They are doing evangelism for the most part. Yeah, yeah. you got to be careful. Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, I appreciate so much what you're doing and uh, the, the whole organization, but your story has been awesome. In terms of wrapping up, was there anything I didn't mention that you wanted to talk about? Oh, no. Thank you so much. You're a wonderful interviewer, Tim. I really enjoyed being here. And um, yeah, I hope people who are in need of any kind of support, whether you've been out for a long time or maybe you've always been an atheist, but you just don't know a lot of people in your area and you just feel like you still need people to talk to, by all means, contact Recovering from Religion. If you're still religious, if you expect to always be religious, but maybe you feel like something has happened in your church that uh, you don't feel good about and you just want to talk about that without having somebody tell you it's terrible and you should leave, be, feel free to contact us or anyone in between. We're here for you, whatever you need. Mm. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Well, uh, I'll just wrap up by saying we've been speaking with Rachel Hunt. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much. Great to hear your story. Great to get to know you. And uh, I'll sh ho hopefully I'll run into you at some point, one of these conferences that you all do or the fall excursion. I'll get there someday. Uh, but thank you That'd so much. Great. great to get to know you. Uh, it's been great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.